was too much, it was too long. He was out of order. He was embarrass embarrassing. But it is the protocol of kingship. And even from the inside, for someone he loved, he was criticized. And he told that person, oh yeah, next time I'll dance even harder. I'll dance even longer. I'll sing even stronger because it is about me and my God. So if you think we sing too long or take too long, it isn't about you, it is about me and you and you and you and you and our God. Give a hand clap to the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what a presence of the Lord in this place. What a presence. What a presence. Oh, thank you, Jesus. In this same spirit, our worship hasn't ceased. We worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings, either cash and check in the back, rear, basket or online there in the name of the Lord give to the Lord as a worship and as of gratitude and just like every type of worship the more we appreciate what the Lord has done in our lives the more we will happily give believe it or not we're halfway through 2022 could you believe that Man, it's crazy. With the beginnings of summer, next week, parents or young children or teenagers, most don't drive yet, so you are responsible. We want to bless your children by educating him, them in what the scripture says about things that are happening nowadays. So we're going to put the flyer up next Sunday Okay, at what time? Uh, Cheo, Jess, do you want them here? 12, I think it's 12. You could come at noon sharp. 11.30, even better. You could come here. We're going to be in our spanking brand new children slash everything room. <laughs> and they will be blessed. Amen. The women also have an event in July. If you could put that fire out, Delilah. So those that like the beach, kind of like the beach, don't like the beach, guess what? It's beach day anyway. Anointed Oasis. The ladies going on July 9th, bright and early. Any information, see Jolanda. I want to bless those and thank those that are fasting today with us. Presenting to the Lord our bodies and holy sacrifice. Esther was a princess in training and found out some things that were out of order. And she went to her uncle who raised her and said, tell the people to fast on my behalf because I'm in there all alone but you guys are out here and the people fasted they didn't even give the animals food that day okay everybody fasted even Toby fasted <laughs> and God gave her results Amen. you want results in the Holy Ghost take some time to pray and fast I mean, I go on a tangent. I can say a few things about fasting. But... Oh, God is so good. Man, I'm excited about this word. I'm excited about this word. Lord, help us that it may be you and not me. That our hearts be open to hear from you, Lord. We have worshiped, we have praised, and we will continue to worship and praise you. But there is a word for us, Lord. I thank you so, so very much. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This is one of those chapters where are not read that often. It's a quite obscure story. And I tell you, I've been reading it for two weeks and reading it and reading it and reading it and it just absolutely blows my mind. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And just get ready. Get ready, get ready. Particularly those, I'm going to be straight to the point. Particularly those with a prophetic flow. Particularly, particularly those that God speaks to, reveals to, gives dreams to. By the way, that should be everyone in this room. Particularly you. God has a word for you. Amen. Second Kings 9. We'll read the first few chapters. Second Kings 9, 1. Yes. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said, to, I need to stop right there. Whenever you read, study the scriptures, you cannot just have your favorite type of Bible. When it's NLT, NLV, and NIV, you need to always have a secondary Bible with you, particularly, I believe, the King James Version. You may not understand it fully, but boy, it is the most exact interpretation of old Hebrew and Greek translations. Because quite frankly, the Bible is perfect, but they missed out on something very important here, these newer versions of scripture. Because the King James says, the prophet Elijah summoned a son of the prophets. That's a big difference okay and said to him tuck your cloak into your belt take this flask of oil with you go to Ramoth Gilead Gilead okay when you get there look for Jehu son of Josephat it's important to add what King James teaches because this was just not one fly by night. Let me see uh, you. This was a son of a prophet. This was what we call now a spiritual son. This was someone who was following Elijah and went to the prophetic schools that he led. This is key to understand. He picks a particular person. Gives him an assignment. And says, look for this Jehu guy. Who happens to be the son of Josephat. The son of Nimshi. Go to him. Get him away from his companions. Take him to the inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, comma, this is what I want you to declare. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Now it starts getting weird. Then open the door and run. Yo, that blew my mind. That blew my mind. We're going to speak to you today. Speak to you today. Tuck in your mantle and run. A cloak is a mantle. What a cloak was, a mantle for dressing up seasons or days. You go to a wedding, you did not wear just your everyday mantle. You wear your cloak. It was dressier, fine linen usually, more colorful, and it was dress up, not dress down. So since we have spoken about mantle and they're so similar, give me the liberty to change that word, even though every single uh, uh, translation that I saw used the word cloak because after all, he's anointing someone to be king. But I want to use the word mantle. Will you give me that privilege? Okay. So we're going to take our mantles and run. The son of the company of the prophets. Tucking that cloak that mantle and tighten it up. 
for a new assignment. You see, when you look here, Jehu was the son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a rare breed because he was a good king, a God-loving king, a king who served the Lord. Jessica ministered to us two weeks ago under the title Revival Strategies and was talking about this man of God, this king called Jehoshaphat. Look at some of the things that this man did quickly so you understand the background of his son. This man that was spoken about two weeks ago was a king and it was spoken about so perfectly. But I need to remind you because it was 14 days ago that this King Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, did what was right before the eyes of the Lord. He was a dedicated worshiper. He was a successful leader. He is the one that developed forts and ships and made Israel, uh, uh, Judah rather, a, a, a star in the waters, in the oceans, in the seas. He was a dedicated worshiper. He was successful in developing these things. Even more, he loved God so much, he assigned, the Bible said, teachers to go into towns to teach them the ways of God because they have been in false teachings and in idolatry and in bad religions for so long. He actually sent what we know now as missionaries into Judah to teach the people about God again. That is an impressive king. They talk about his son here who happened to be a soldier, very similar to David. He was a high-ranking soldier. And the great Elisha speaks to and picks this young prophet of God and gives him these particular instructions. Tells him who to go, where to go, who to speak to, and what to do, right? Pretty clear up to then. Where to go, who to look for, and what to say or do. But it gets odd when he tells them, tighten your belt of your mantle and run once you're done. That's why I needed to stop and ask God, what is it that you are trying to say to me through these words? Whenever we've gotten instructions for God that may be a bit odd. A, a bit out of the norm. Uh, what is our reaction? This young prophet got very unusual instructions. Go. And he went. He went to the right place at the right time. So far, so good. He asked for Jehu and he finds him. So far, so good. He takes him into the private room, in private, not in public, so far, so good. He follows the instruction of his spiritual father to the key. He anoints him with oil. My question now is, why did not Elijah go? This is pretty important. Tell you in a minute. You see, because whether we agree or not with scripture, the oil flows first through the leader and is passed forward to the disciples and those that follow that call. When he sent the young guy is to see how he would react to gaining a stronger mantle, a, more, a mantle of more responsibility and a mantle of more gifting in the prophetic. The assignment got weird and unusual, and he obeyed it to the T. I want to tell you something really, really important here. You see, because anointing Jehu as king, you remember Elijah. You remember when Elijah was all depressed because Jezebel was out to kill him? You remember when he's hiding out in the woods and the stream and he's all depressive and he wishes he was dead? You remember that angels came to serve him, not once but twice, and his depression caused him to sleep and sleep again? Well, in that experience of the great Elijah, God speaks to him and gives him three instructions, three assignments. He says, wake up and get up and anoint Hazael king over Aram. He's telling him to anoint a foreign country, a king, in a place that he has nothing to do with. 
He says, anoint Jehu king over Israel and anoint Elisha to take your place. I never realized that he did two out of the three. He never anointed Jehu. In matter of fact, he went in reverse order because the first thing he did was look for Elisha. I wonder why. Can it be that when he found that God was anointing a successor, he was happy about it? Can it be that the trials of ministry and the trials of the prophetic and the trials of leading people had him so burnt out and so sick and tired and so exhausted mentally and physically that he was actually excited that someone was to succeed him? Because he did that first. Then he skips over Jehu and goes to Aram to anoint Hazael there. You see, when we, when a prophet, when someone called by God misses the time for them to speak a word, we could cause a lot of delays. We could cause delays in a person. We could cause delays in a family. We could cause delays in a church. And we could even cause delays in an entire country. Oh, prophets, it's time to tighten the belt of our mantles and run. Prophets arise. And he sent this young man. Let's go back to this encounter. So far, 100% obedience, glory to God. He's doing everything that he's asked. But it is unusual. It is strange. What God put in my heart to declare today is that we are about to go through some uncomfortable assignments. We are about to get through some unique words. We're about to see some weird stuff happening. We're about to see the unusual works of God. We are about to enter a new realm. And today, God says, tie in your mantle and get ready to run in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This young man did as the prophet, his spiritual father, asked him to do to the T. But you know what? The ultimate blesser is God. It is he who chose Jehu from years ago and God was waiting for a man to separate him and anoint him. In the meantime, you're going to see how important the ordination of Jehu was. But something happens in the spirit realm when we are obedient. Something happens in the spirit realm when we decide to say yes to God. Something happens when we're up here and receive a word from God and do what God says and obey, obey and believe him. Something happens in the spirit realm. Because what happened here is something supernatural. He puts oil on Jehu, says the same exact words that the prophet, his spiritual father, told him to say. Mm, but something happened. Oh, boy. Oh, when you're praying for somebody and God starts revealing things or when I'm sitting, standing there and God gives me a picture of something or someone and the first thing I say, Lord, now or later, public or private? And this man is obeying the mandate and the assignment. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the gift of prophecy comes all over him. And he has to say more. He did not only have to say what spiritual daddy said. But the spirit of God came all over him. And look what he says. So the prophet went to verse 4. Went to Ramon Galid, and when he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. And he said, I have a message for your commander. He says, for which one of us? I guess they were all high-ranking soldiers. And he said, Jehu. 
He says, I'm here for you, commander. He replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. And when the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you as king over Israel. You are to destroy the out. Oh, okay, so he did what he said. But look, look, there's more, there's more. You see, when we're obedient, there's more. When we obey God, there's more. There's more blessing. There's more open doors. There's more anointing. There's more glory. There's more revelation. Hallelujah! Because all of a sudden, the spirit of God is all over him. He says, you are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. And I, it says God, not the prophet, but God says, I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants. God does not forget mistreatment. God will not forget murder. Hallelujah. The whole house of Ahab will perish. This is God speaking through the young prophet. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make Jeroboam son of Nebat and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahilja. Uh, uh, and as for Jezebel, get ready, get ready, get ready. That little witch. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her in the plot grounds of Jezreel. And no one will bury her. Guess what he did next? He continued to obey. He got the heck out of there and ran. You see, people get to a certain level and they think they don't need to run anymore. They don't need to obey anymore. They don't need to submit anymore. They don't need to follow instruction anymore. This man was full of the glory of God and the revelation of God and with a strong prophetic gift, but he understood, I so have original instructions that I need to obey. My God, my God, my God. Mission completed. He had one last instruction. I'm running for my life now. I personally believe that Elisha knew that this was going to happen. I personally believe that Elisha, with all the miracles and all the ways God used that man, he knew that he knew there was more to say to Jehu, but he limited what he wanted to say so God could flow through the young man of God. He was testing him to see if he's willing to release the full word that God had. But why run? Because what happened is, when he left and jetted out of there, the other soldiers, remember, high-ranking soldiers, went to Jehu, and they did not say, what did the man of God say? They did not say, what did the young prophet say? What they said was, what did that maniac tell you? You see, we need to learn that in the things of God, as a remnant of God, of people of revival, there will be people and always be people that do not agree with what God is saying and what God is calling us to be and do. And if they do not understand and if they criticize, it does not mean we're wrong. What it means is that they do not have the revelation that God has deposited in this house. He ran to avoid confusion and conflict. He ran because the word was so heavy and so strong. You know why? Because Israel had a present king at the moment. So he was also running for his life. What I'm here to say is that this young prophet was not alone. Because I am sure that when Elisha sent him, Elisha was in hands and knees saying, Lord, use him for your honor and your glory. 
I told you that there will be assignments that will get crazy and unusual. And that's why we need to tighten our God-given mantles and run. Just do it the way God says. Just do it the way God reveals. And just obey what God, the mandates of God. Prophets and prophetic people in this room, I've come today to tell you to tighten your mantle. The time is come to prophesy everything that God has deposited in our lives and in our spirits to say and do in the name of Jesus. This young man, listen carefully, when he ran back home, graduated in the spirit realm. Listen carefully. He graduated from the local church prophet and all of a sudden he was known as a national speaking prophet because he was obeying God to the minimal and to the T. Hallelujah. And we need to learn to stop limiting God. Prophet, prophet Tomi Awayomi has an identical twin. His brother preaches too. And to make us all go crazy, mom called him Toby. So it's Tomi and Toby, and they look identical. Toby, who's the brother that I've never, don't know about, was a guest speaker at a large event. And Tomi said, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to support you. I want to hear the word. I want to I be blessed. And went with him. They are singing up a storm and praising God. And when the time comes for Toby to preach the word, uh, he was nowhere in sight. He was in the men's room. The armor mirror takes his Bible and takes his iPad and puts it on the podium. And the guests, preachers are up there kind of waiting. And the armor bearer is like waiting and they're like hoping and they run and, they, and they're in the bathroom. Hurry up, it's your time. What happened? Hurry up. Tommy, his brother, who's sitting in the front row, tells the armor bearer, give me the iPad. It had facial recognition. So his brother just looked. The iPad opened. He came in, and he was ready to give the word. How did the iPad open? Because they have the same face. They have the same image. And you and I were built in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. What he has, we have. What he owns, we own. What he possesses, we possess. The passion in his heart should be the passion in our heart. Whatever doors he opens are our doors that are opened because we live in the image of God Almighty. That's why we can't stop. That's why we need to tighten our belts and run. Jehu was called back, was called, I'm sorry, as king, to be honest, to knock some heads off. He was called to destroy the works of the devil. Talking about being a warrior in the spirit, man, did he take his experience as a war man to the things of God? He did exactly what that prophet said. It was during his reign, not previous reigns, his reign that finally Ahab and Jezebel were murdered and destroyed. Because he received the word that Israel had been waiting for for years that Elijah never gave. God is calling us to be brave prophets. God is calling our young people to be prophetic. God is calling experienced prophets to be bold. God is calling preachers and teachers and members and anyone that dares say yes to be used by God. God is calling us to occupy. Melissa, you mentioned this word four times in the few words that you said Thursday, I had them counted. Occupy. 
occupy the, the definition to take and hold possession of. Listen carefully. To take and hold possession of most times by force. Occupy is not, can I have that candy, please? Can I have that candy, please? Occupy is to take it and say, this is mine now. When we occupy, we have to have spiritual nastiness. Mm. Oh, yeah, we're called to love and we're called to respect but do you think Ahab and Jezebel loved and respected the people of Israel, the prophets of God? No, what they did is do mass murders and kill them. Thank God there was a hundred hiding in caves. So when the going gets tough and we find ourselves in severe spiritual attack, niceness goes in the back pocket and when we come, we become warriors of almighty God. A passive church has prophets hiding in caves. A occupying church has prophets declaring the words of God. Amen. I'm going to get political with you for a couple of minutes, all right? You know I like current events. I'm going to get political with you. In the prior administration, when the American army and some other countries as well, France, Great Britain, our allies, were in Afghanistan. We were in Afghanistan. We were not in war with Afghanistan. We were an occupying force. Do you know why we were not no longer at war with Afghanistan? Because we had already won that war. When we occupy, Jesus already paid the price and won the war. We are called to occupy. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And while we were in Afghanistan, the last 18 months, while we were there, not one American soldier died. Not one. Because they were not at war. They were occupied. They were just walking around, heavy machinery, heavy guns, making sure that the peace is kept. The agreement was, Taliban, you stay over there, we're going to stay over here. You do whatever the heck you want in the mountains. You can do whatever you want out there. Just leave Kabul and the capital alone because these people want to progress. They want to stay Muslim, fine, but we want them to progress. And now what we have there in this outright disaster. Why? Because we stopped occupying. To know that a country does not allow women to be nurses or teachers that are allowed only to stay home. They're having trouble even going to stores alone again because we stopped occupying. It's a national disgrace. I told you I was going to get political for a minute. I'm done with that. Occupying means that when we have the wherewithal to maintain what Jesus already placed here on earth. He placed the church here on earth. He's given us salvation through his blood. And we as the church are called to occupy and maintain what Jesus has given us as his church. We need to occupy. And like someone said at that conference, you cannot occupy sitting from a lazy boy chair. When you occupy, you occupy by force. I just pray if 15 or 20 of you can get this word and understand why sometimes we struggle. Why sometimes we go through spiritual attack. Why it's been so difficult to get answers from God is because we're occupying what once belonged to the devil. We are occupying with the force of the kingdom of God. But I have good news for you for 2 Corinthians 5, 
4 and 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds. Listen, 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 listen. I've never seen this before. It doesn't say digging out strongholds. It doesn't say pulling out. It says pulling down. That means they're in the atmosphere. They're in the spirit realm. So we are pulling down strongholds that are in the atmosphere of central New Jersey by praying and fasting and doing the will of God. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The weapons that we occupy with are to break strongholds. To stay united and not be argumentative. And to, ex and, and to exalt ourselves against, not exalt ourselves against the knowledge of God. It is him, not us. Because we are occupying a vast territory. A prophet recently was heading to Canada. And this is why I know this is an on-time word because this happened this week. And he fell asleep on the airplane. He falls asleep and turbulence shook the airplane very violently that woke him up. The pilot gets on the speaker and says, listen carefully. The clouds don't want us here in Canada. So please fasten your seatbelts. I need to repeat that. The pilot got on the speaker and said, some clouds here in Canada don't want us here. Please fasten your seatbelts. The prophet immediately heard that and said, God, there's something spiritual to happen and started to pray and heard the voice of God that told him, I am sending you to Canada to break the spirit of politeness. And the prophet said, the plane is shaking up and down, and he said, the spirit of what? We're called to be loved and be love people. We're called to be sweet, loving, to be nice. What is a spirit of Panay? And God spoke to him. He said, yes, my people have become too passive, too complacent, and too intimidated, and they are stuck in a spirit of fear. They're too polite. This prophetic stuff is a serious calling from God. It's a great calling from God, but it's a, I think we need, as of today, take it a bit more seriously. This isn't about giving each other prophet, prophetic words of encouragement. This is about breaking strongholds and changing a nation. We need prophets that will stand up and say, yes and amen. I will go and I will say it. If that young man tells Elijah, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I have time. I don't know if I could go. You want me to go alone? Why don't you go? Maybe it would have been years more of Ahab and Jezebel doing havoc to the people of God. Isn't that something? So in the name of Jesus, we rebuke the spirit of fear. We rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus with all authority that we have, Lord. We rebuke it and cast it out now in the name of Jesus. Take it out of our vocabulary that we will not limit ourselves, Lord, ever again. Oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And church, the social media stuff about we woke, we woke. Yes, we woke. They want to call us fanatical, let them call us fanatical. They want to call us crazy, let them call us crazy. Jesus, by the way, was called crazy. Jesus, by the way, was called fanatical. Even from his inner circle, they told him, Jesus, chill out. That was a bit strong. He says, why? You want to go too? Because he was on a mission from God the Father. There are too many loose mantles out there. Listen 
carefully, church. Too many mantles that are used only on Sundays. Too many mantles that are used only to please. Too many mantles that are taken off Monday through Saturday. Too many mantles that are used only in a big prophetic conference. And God is saying, tie up your mantle, make it tight, and run in the name of Jesus. Jehu accomplished everything that God declared to him. Every single thing. Ahab was murdered. Jezebel, exactly like the prophet said, she didn't even have the decency to be buried. Dogs ate her up, and they only found two hands and two feet. That's kind of gross, but it's in the Bible. Desperate times are calling a church to wake up with desperate measures. I want everyone with their eyes closed. Everyone, everyone in this room with their eyes closed. This is what the Lord put in my heart. I want the bold prophets to stand up. Everyone with their eyes closed. Bold prophets to stand up. I honor you. I honor you for your boldness. I honor you for being self-assured in what God is placing on you. And I call you to take steps forward. I call you now to take steps forward in the spirit of not just being a local prophet, but let's be a prophet to this community. Let's be prophets to this region. Let's be prophets to this state. Let's be prophets in the workplace. And let's be prophets wherever we go. We could be prophets at the gas station. We could be prophets at Walmart. We could be prophets at, at the restaurant with, with the waitress or the waiter. Let us be bold and Say like this young man, I will do what my father says. I'm going to ask all bold leaders of this house to please stand. Bold men and women, please stand. I praise you and I honor you for what God is doing in your life. And I ask for you to be bolder like never before. To be stronger like never before. That we're like this unnamed young prophet because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about likes on Facebook and about Instagram ads. It was about seeing the glory of God and changing a nation. His reward is in heaven. Bold children, would you please stand? It's a fire upon our children. They have been lit up, and we have to flame, fan the flames, fan the flames, fan the flames of revival on our children. How they're worshiping, how they're jumping, how they're dancing before the Lord. How hungry they are to learn. Now for the next two months, they're not contaminated in school. Take advantage and fill them with God. Fill them with the words of God. Fill them with stories of God. With testimonies of what God has done in your life. We are an occupying force desperate for revival an occupying force intent in obeying every single mandate of the Lord. An occupying force that will do what God says to do, even if it's weird, strange, crazy, and unique. We are an occupying force here in New Jersey. Hallelujah. And this country needs us more than ever. Yes, Lord. More. Tighten your mantle and run with the vision of God. 
run to do the will of the Father. Run, listen, 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 listen. Run and catch up of the wasted months and the wasted years. God says run and you will catch up and there will be no regret. Run. Run like this young man. Run. And do the will of God. There is so much, so much we could do. I don't want to be stuck, folks, as a young church with potential. No, 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 no. I want to fulfill our potential. Because potential is an unfulfilled future. That's what potential is. We have to work at it and work at it and work at it to fulfill what God has called us to be and do. So I honor you, every single person. And I thank God for you. Because every single person in this room has the opportunity to be used by God in the name of Jesus. Tying that mantle. God gave mantles here a few weeks ago. Time to tang those mantles and run with the vision of God there's anyone here that needs the Lord if there's anyone here that's struggling had a difficult difficult time season week if you need prayer want prayer desire prayers we're here to pray with you if anyone is in this room that needs Jesus needs to know that Jesus that called these men and women to do great things that are in scripture come and receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord church let's move forward let's sing to the Lord now let's sing to the Lord a war cry of victory okay a war cry of victory because you got it in you you got it in you to be used by God almighty